I'm uh, so pleased to welcome our class day speaker, Catherine Farley, who will now be introduced by Corey uh, Zengabot. Corey is a 2009 alumna of the Master in Architecture program. She's now a senior urban designer and architect for the Boston Planning and Redevelopment Agency and a member of our Alumni Council. Uh, please welcome Corey. Thank you, Moisen. I'm here today to quickly do three things. Introduce Catherine Farley, your class day speaker, welcome you to the GSD alumni community, and lastly, congratulate you and your parents. Um, I'm gonna do that in reverse order. So first, congratulations. This is one of many congratulations you've already received and will receive, but my congratulations is on behalf of the GSD Alumni Council, the representative body of our alumni community, which consists of 12,500 GSD alums across the world. They couldn't all be here today, so on their behalf, I wish to say welcome to the club. However, I'm going to guess that you, like I did when I was graduating, have spent approximately zero time thinking about what that might mean. The good news is that the Alumni Council has been thinking about you. In fact, we have thought of you as alumni in training from the moment you matriculated. I know it's hard to imagine right now, as some of you probably can't wait to get out of Gund, but we do hope that you continue to be engaged in the school. The Alumni Council is one avenue for engagement, but there are countless others. The Council, for those who may not be familiar, is made up of about 50 alumni from all the different programs, decades, and geographies across the world that meet twice yearly in our ongoing quest to serve as ambassadors for the school and for you. We also try to connect through public programs and activities like portfolio reviews, professional programs, and receptions, but also at professional conferences and alumni events around the world. I hope you'll remain connected with the GSD if you are living in the area or beyond. In my time as a member of the council, I've had the opportunity to deepen my engagement with the school and learn about the programs and activities that you and your fellow students are working on. This year alone, you've organized conferences here at the GSD and with students from HBS and the college. You mobilized to march in Washington, DC. You fought for the presence of all gender restrooms and created an overall supportive community for your fellow GSD students. I'm being truly sincere when I say you're an inspiration to us on the Alumni Council. I was very fortunate to recently meet with a group of uh, women in design students who came to City Hall several weeks ago to meet with GSD alumni who are working in government. Uh, that's just one model, but I hope that you continue to reach out. Now for a bit of housekeeping. One for the key ways you can remain connected is to maintain a current profile on the Harvard Alumni Directory. Some of you may already be familiar with this as a way to connect with alums, but you should continue to use this as a resource to reach out to your fellow GSD alumni, the larger alum Harvard alumni community, and current students who may be seeking your advice in the near future. The Alumni Relations Office has a gift for you. Uh, uh, is that a jump drive? Yes, it's a jump drive um, that includes information on ways to remain connected and what resources you will have access to as alumni. These will be available for you in the lobby following our speaker today and also tomorrow following the degree ceremony. Tomorrow you'll become GSD alumni, but you'll also be part of the larger Harvard Alumni Association, HAA, that represents over 350,000 Harvard alumni worldwide. I hope you have a chance to experience the afternoon program tomorrow when Henry Cobb receives the Har Harvard Medal, the highest honor to a member of the Harvard alumni community. Harry will be the first living GSD alum to receive this award presented by President Drew Fast. It's also important to mention that during my time in the Alumni Council, I've learned the importance of giving back to support the school, not just with my time, but in support of the commitment for financial aid that so many of you receive. This is something we commit to as a Harvard Al Alumni Council members and try to model as a behavior for our fellow alumni to support in future generations of design leaders like you. I'm honored to be here to welcome you to the community of GSD alumni. We hope you continue your design leadership in whatever career you pursue. And on that note, I am delighted to present Catherine Farley, Masters of Architecture, class of 1976, who has shown tremendous design leadership throughout her long and successful career at Tishman Spire. 
Though she recently retired as Senior Managing Director, where she was responsible for the Brazil and China businesses and global corporate marketing after a 32-year career at the company, she is still quite busy, it sounds like, um, as Chairman of the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts. She has been involved at Lincoln Center since 1999, having served on the New York Philharmonic Orchestra Board from 1999 to 2005, and on the Lincoln Center Theater Board from 2002 to 2005. She was chairman of the Lincoln Center Redevelopment Project from 2006 to 2010, a $1.2 billion comprehensive renovation of the campus. I'm sure her GSD degree served her very well in that capacity. She's also served on numerous boards, including the International Rescue Committee, a nonprofit organization that focuses on emergency relief and resettlement of refugees, Board of Trustees for Bound University, the um, Alvin Ailey, uh, American Dance Theater and the board of the Lang Lang International Music Foundation from 2012 to 2016. I am very honored to introduce your 2017 Class Day speaker, Catherine Farley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am so glad to be back at the GSD today, and I'm honored to be here on this momentous occasion. I graduated from the GSD 41 years ago. Hand calculators, as they were called at the time, were about this big, and they weighed about three pounds, and you were not allowed to use them on exams. That was considered cheating. Slide rules only. We also drew all the time, only. We drew on sloped drafting boards, yellow trace, pencils, markers, and rapidograph pens for special presentations. Yeah, I know, it sounds like Jurassic Park, doesn't it? In so many ways, that was a different world. And yet, the mission you are on today, as you graduate, is the same. It's at least as important now as it was then. Creating excellence in design the built environment, and the arts for this complex contemporary world has perhaps never been more challenging or more important. It's a grand and an essential mission, and your role in it will be a vital one. Simply put, we need you. As you mark this great occasion and embark upon your careers, I'd like to speak with you about two things I think have not changed since my day. First, the importance of framing the right question. I believe the GSD has prepared you for a much broader role in the working world than you might imagine as you sit here today. Applying the open-ended creative thinking that you learned at the GSD to your own talents and to your careers will expand your opportunities and increase the likelihood of your success and happiness. I'd like to talk to you today about how it helped me find my way, about goals, about the role of failure, risk, and luck. I'll share with you a couple of battle scars from my early days as I struggled, as I made mistakes, as I zigged and zagged, ultimately finding a full measure of purpose and pleasure in my life, but not right away. Secondly, I'd like to talk today about how to deliver the punch, impact. I'd like to share with you a few things I learned in my journey about how to leverage all of the talent and effort you will invest in your careers so that you can have the maximum impact on the issues that you care about. Let's start by talking about you, how you think about yourself, how you frame the right question for you. It may not have occurred to you yet, but Whatever your background was before coming to the GSD, you are now poised to become the leaders of this generation. You have the best education available on the planet. You're trained in nonlinear thinking, that special way of addressing problems where you hold multiple hypotheses in your mind while you extrapolate and iterate, generating additional op options. You know how to solve the visual and intellectual equivalent of a multivariable equation. You're familiar with the kind of creative thinking that is essential to solving the complex challenges we face today. 
Your education here at the GSD has qualified you to do big things. In the world of architecture, urban planning, landscape, and design, yes, but also in lots of other professional spheres. You are the leaders who will shape this generation's environment, policy, business, and government. It is a fearsome responsibility. I realize that the thought of being a global leader, as you sit here today, may seem immodest or maybe just preposterous. But someone in your generation will be a global leader. So why not you? In case no one has told you yet, you can and you will do something important. Let me be the voice to tell you that if you haven't heard it before. You're well prepared for it. I know it. The important thing is that you know it. To quote Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. With this excellent education under your belt and armed with the confidence that you will succeed, it's more than important than ever to have the right goals, right? Wrong. All the parents in the audience won't want me to say this, but it is just not possible for someone as you sit here today to know exactly what your ambition is or what your strategy should be for getting there. You just don't have enough information. Understanding the context of our own moment in history has always been difficult. Recognizing trends around us and seeing the patterns that will form the future has never been simple. We are living now in a particularly turbulent time, but it is clear that there are many opportunities for you to do important work. The environment's increasingly under siege. Urban development is occurring around the world at an enormous speed, sometimes with great thought and sometimes with just speed. Space use is changing. Think of we work, we live. Think of hoteling or capsule hotels. Space needs are changing. Think of the growing needs for senior housing, for aging baby boomers. Think of the 65 million displaced refugees in the refugee crisis today. There's no shortage of work. You are more likely than you expect, as you sit here today, to have a significant impact on the world in your next 40 years. It's up to you just what that impact will be. The biggest question facing you now is how you spend your time, your talent, and your education. It is easy to be intimidated by the enormity of that question. It may help to think in terms of gradual approximations as you adjust over time and you get new information. Think of tacking towards a generalized North Star, not trying to sail directly there, but approaching it in shorter increments. Think of adjusting to changing winds, abandoning directions that don't seem useful, aiming at getting closer and closer to finding something you love that achieves something meaningful. The shortest distance between two points, if it's careers we're talking about, is not a straight line. Personally, I did a whole lot of tacking, and I risked capsizing a lot before I finally hit a career that worked for me. When I was accepted at the GSD, there was a catch. I had to pass an intensive six-week physics course in the summer. I was undaunted because I'd always been a pretty good student. But when I arrived and I noticed that the class was mostly all pre-meds and they all had slide rules sticking out of their pockets, I started to get a little worried. Then they told us that there was not a textbook and the lectures had been pre-recorded on cassettes but in order to have the right to buy the cassettes, you had to first pass a course in trigonometry, a test in trigonometry, and a test in calculus. Now, I was really worried. I had majored in studio art and literature. I had never studied either trigonometry or calculus. But soldiering on, I bought a textbook in each, and I spent the weekend reading them as I would read a novel, hoping that my liberal arts skills would pull me through. The way the course worked, each student would take a test in their seat, walk to the front of the auditorium, get an answer sheet, score their own test, 
and then report their score to the proctor. I saw the pre-med students knocking off the tests right away, going down to the front, take the cassettes. They were ready to rock and roll. The class was held in the newly built Science Center Auditorium designed by Jose Luis Cert, and the impeccable acoustics had been much praised. So I took my test to the front, I compared it to the answer sheet, and I whispered quietly to the proctor, I think you gave me the wrong answer sheet because you can see there is no correlation between my answers and the answer sheet. Suddenly, behind me, the entire auditorium was chuckling and then hooting and laughing. And I realized that the perfect acoustics of that auditorium made it possible for every pre-med to understand my abject humiliation at that moment. I finally understood this was gonna be hard. I had already established myself before day one as the caboose in the class. I'd quit my job, I'd borrowed money to go to Harvard, and if I couldn't pass this class, I was out of luck. I sweated all summer, and only because of substantial remedial coaching by my older brother, who was a physics PhD, was I finally able to get the cassettes halfway through the summer. I never got such a bad grade in any course, and I never was so proud to earn it. I passed. The reason I am humiliating myself by telling you this story is to point out that sometimes failures along the way even though they are excruciating, don't really matter. Do the best you can. Expect them. Move on. Don't think of it as failing. Think of it as tacking forward. I took a big financial risk to come to the GSD, and I'm guessing some of you did too. I was hoping I'd make it as an architect. But when I left the GSD, the architecture market was terrible. And I took a job working at Turner Construction Company because they would pay me $2,000 a year more, which made the difference in my ability to pay back my student loans. It felt like a major setback. In those days, a so-called non-traditional job was considered a failure. And worse than that, I hated it. I thought I'd made a, made a mistake I could never recover from, going into debt I couldn't afford, to get a degree I wasn't even using. Then a surprising opportunity came up. The Chinese government asked the company to join a consortium to compete for a huge mixed-use complex in Beijing. The odds of winning seemed very low, and the proposal had to be made in person over Thanksgiving. So no one senior in the company wanted to go. I volunteered. I had never been anywhere. This all happened in 1979 just as relations between the United States and China were being normalized. And this provided an historic context that was key to our success. I spent three weeks in Beijing negotiating around the clock with this consortium, translating every word in both directions through an interpreter. To everyone's surprise, at the end of three weeks, we made a deal. We had a huge project in Beijing. Then, back at Turner, corporate life being what it is, I was a China expert. I was surprised, too. <laughs> this became my lifelong love affair with Asia. I also discovered that I love business, and no one was more surprised than I was. I thought of myself as an artist and an architect temporarily marooned in the business world. But I discovered I really loved business, and I had to adjust my own thinking. With the benefit of hindsight, I was thinking of my own skills in way too narrow a way. For those of you who may be taking a non-traditional job as you graduate, I encourage you to think about yourself and your job with an open mind. It's not a second-rate departure from the design dream. It can often be a new direction where you will discover new talent you don't know you have. These new directions may not be possible to envision today, but be alert to them and look for them. Don't limit yourself to becoming the next Misep Andero. Think broadly, directly, indirectly, outside the box, any way you can. Question your assumptions. Discard your preconceptions and imagine the possibilities. Try to think about both yourself and your path forward the way you learned to think at the GSD. 
These ways of thinking are almost certainly much more valuable than anything specific you've learned here. They can help you solve a whole range of complex problems facing us today, and they will open up many fascinating avenues towards your success in your career. When I got the chance to go to China, it was definitely a lucky break, and you will have lucky breaks too. The trick is in recognizing them. Many lucky breaks come disguised as catastrophes, as failures, as setbacks, as non-traditional paths. Be ready to grab those lucky breaks when they come. Be flexible about thinking about them and about your own personal ability to participate in them. Don't let the way you define yourself today limit you, and don't let your Thanksgiving vacation plans stop you from going for it. Expect to make mistakes. Admit them when you make them. Some, like my physics disaster, don't really matter very much, although they hurt. Some, unfortunately, do matter. But at least try not to make the same mistakes again. And that actually turns out to be much harder than it sounds. Evaluate your mistakes often and honestly. Cut your losses early and be analytical about what didn't work out. And importantly, get going in another direction that looks more promising. After eight years at Turner, traveling around Asia and the Pacific, working on business development, I was ready to move on. This time, I knew I wanted a business position, but I wanted something that also involved my design interest. I got a job at Tishman Spire, which at the time was a young, small, New York-based real estate developer who was working only in the US. At the time, conventional wisdom was that real estate is a local business. That worked for me. I was tired of traveling. But after a year of working on a project in New York, I was restless. I missed the challenges of international work. I had not accurately predicted what would make me happy, which is something we human beings are uniquely bad at. Instead of looking for a new job, I decided to try to turn the job I had into a job that had more of what I liked. A colleague from my previous China work, who was then working at American Express, approached me with a deal in Beijing. I decided to present it at Tishman Spire, taking what felt like an enormous risk. Picture my presentation. My numbers had been prepared on a yellow legal pad with a pencil, with lots of erasing. To say that I had no clue how to do an underwriting was the understatement of the millennium. Despite my primitive underwriting skills, I was able to per persuade the company that there was a lot of opportunity in China and this, that this was worth exploring. The company took a big risk, too. Let me give you a vignette of those early days in China. We were working in Beijing with a huge, sophisticated international partner, American Express. So you get the sense of the scale of the risk of what this represented for everyone involved. The Chinese government would not, in those days, allow foreign companies to rent office space so all corporate offices were in the Soviet-designed Beijing Hotel. This meant that any meeting within the regional office of American Express was held sitting kneecap to kneecap on two parallel twin beds. The accounting department, such as it was, was a huge desktop computer on the vanity in the bathroom. And our Chinese counterparty, who didn't trust our computer, sat patiently on the commode with a giant abacus, checking our numbers. And she was usually faster than our computer at the time. Interestingly and surprisingly, working on this China project led directly to Tishman Spire's first project in Europe. Citibank was looking for a developer for a troubled project in Frankfurt. And because there were so few American developers working outside the US, they approached us. This became Tishman Spire's first built project outside the United States, the Mesoturm project in Frankfurt, designed by Helmut Jahn. It was the tallest building in Europe for some time, and it was a symbol of Frankfurt for many, many years. It launched our international business and my career with it. In the meantime, the Beijing American Express Center was fully designed and financed, ready to start construction, 
when the student strikes and violence in Tiananmen Square occurred in 1989. The market for the project literally disappeared overnight. Tishman Spire left too, pulling up stakes and giving up on both the project and the idea of a business in China for a while. This improbable path from New York to China to Frankfurt was the beginning of Tishman Spire's global business, which we expanded into in England, France, Spain, Poland, Italy, Brazil, Argentina, India, and then back to China. This was also the beginning of my 32 years at Tishman Spire, during which time, at various points, I ran virtually all of our international businesses. Today, Tishman Spire is one of the leading international developers. We're working in, on projects in 30 markets in seven countries. The work during my time varied from new towns on the outskirts of Shanghai to business centers in India, from the Golden Triangle in Paris to the new port in Rio de Janeiro. I had the privilege of being right in the middle of it. I had somehow blundered my way into a great job I never dreamed of. Not only was my personal path lacking in any specific goal at the outset, it was completely nonlinear, zigging and zagging from design to business, from local to global. I had to challenge my preconceived ideas about my own talents, and I had to shape the job I had to suit me better. I definitely took risks, sometimes even taking risks I didn't understand at the time. I had setbacks and I made mistakes, but I also had some lucky breaks and successes, always fumbling forward, gradually tacking towards something that felt generally right. So remember to use your GSD creative training as you think about your own talents and your career. Remember to look hard for those lucky breaks, especially when they're disguised as setbacks, and be willing to take a risk to take advantage of them. I'd like to talk for just a minute now about impact. Once you've framed the right question and have thought creatively about your own talents and have shaped your job and your career, allowing yourself to fail and zig and zag along the way, it's very important also to think about how to have the maximum impact in your career, how to bring your ideas from abstraction into action, how to make something happen. Think of what you're doing in terms of your effect and not just your output. The metaphysical question has been asked, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, if you ask me, if it's your career we're talking about, the answer is it definitely does not. If no one reads the report you wrote, it doesn't matter how good it is. If no one hears your idea, it doesn't matter that it was brilliant. For me, possibly the biggest surprise about entering the working world was learning that getting something done is always all about people. Being right is only the beginning of getting something done. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. This will be true whether you are designing someone's home, a city plan, a new policy, or an algorithm. Getting something done and making something happen has much, much, much more to do with people than with anything else. People make the difference between the good idea that gets lost and the good idea that changes the world. So here are seven things that I've learned about how to maximize your impact. Tip number one, the importance of building relationships. Relationships are critically important everywhere, even more so with the ascendance of technology. Build good long-term relationships which will become your network of support over time. Be a team player. Be the person other people want to work with. Be willing to take up the slack and do the uninteresting work that your team needs done. Be willing to be a good supporter of other people. Be generous with your praise and help. Always take the high road. Always do what's right in the long term, and never Assume that someone you treated poorly will disappear from your life because the world is very interconnected and very small, and your professional world is even smaller. 
So not only are these old-fashioned pieces of advice the right thing to do, over a lifetime, they will help you build relationships that will be critical to your success. Tip number two, creating leverage for your talents. All of you have highly specialized talents and rightly are very proud of your expertise. But because we are also specialized today, the need for collaboration among different areas of expertise is much greater than ever before. Partnerships provide leverage for you as you address the issues that interest you. Collaborating with other people provides an opportunity for learning things you don't know. Occasionally, it even shows you that you are wrong. No one ever wants to hear that, but we all know it's extremely valuable. You can learn from anyone, and I hope you will commit yourself to continuing to learn throughout your life. Don't discount anyone or any experience as a learning opportunity. People from other specialties, peers, older people, younger people, people from other countries and cultures, you may find people who are intimidated by your Harvard degree, and you may have to encourage them to share with you what they know. Sometimes you just need to be observant in order to learn something. I remember one summer when I was working as a carpenter. I was installing flooring, and I was working with a guy who had no high school degree, and he had a kind of a dirty crew cut. I noticed that when I hammered the nail into the wood, I very often split the wood. And he never did. When I asked him what the secret was, he didn't answer me. He just showed me as he slid the nail through his dirty hair and hammered it into the wood, saying, the grease helps it slide. Now, I'm sure there are other techniques for installing flooring, <laughs> but this one definitely works. You can learn from anyone. Communication, tip number three. Despite the increased nationalism and isolationism in the ether today, the globalization genie is out of the bottle. We're more global than ever, ever, but we are certainly not homogeneous. As I look around this wonderful crowd today, I'm thrilled to see so many different nationalities represented. There's a greater need than ever, as all of us know, to bridge across our differences. It's critical to understand, if you want to get something done, what lens other people bring, what history, what culture, what expertise they bring to the issue at hand. It's especially important to understand with clarity what lens you bring to the discussion. And if this isn't a nonlinear exercise perfect for your GSD education, I don't know what is. Now that the international business world often speaks such excellent English, it's tempting for us Americans to assume everyone thinks and communicates as we do. We discovered in my time at Turner that even when the same language is spoken, even when there are two native English speakers, one from Singapore, one from New York, the, the way they communicate is so different, it caused us a lot of problems till we understood it. Let me explain. If I ask an American colleague, how's the project? He'll say, great, on time, on budget. If I ask my Singaporean colleague the same question with the same project facts, he will say quietly, I think it should probably be OK. The New Yorker hears that and immediately says, why? What's the matter? What's wrong? Because if we use that conditional language, it would mean something was wrong. The Singaporean justifiably feels a little irritated because then they feel they just said everything was OK, and they're wondering why the New Yorker is continuing to cross-examine them in such an aggressive way. On the other hand, if the uh, <clears throat> Singaporean asked the New Yorker the same question and got, project's great, on time, on budget, the Singaporean might feel that the American was exaggerating, was missing the nuances of the project, and was maybe even misrepresenting the facts. Communication's not easy in either direction, so commit yourself to listening with care and with an astutely focused cultural lens. Understanding how different cultures communicate bad news is critically important if you're responsible for a project in a remote location. Americans generally think that the best way to communicate bad news is directly and immediately. 
And Americans feel anything other than that sometimes lacks transparency or even is deliberately misleading. In Asia, I'm told that communicating indirectly is a sign of respect. It's, since a subordinate would never embarrass someone from headquarters by showing there was something they didn't know. The boss is supposed to be in charge, after all. The Asian hint, or indirect communication, which is often disregarded by Americans at their peril, can be easily misunderstood. I learned this the hard way when I was traveling with my family in India. The travel agent, when we were planning the trip, commented mildly that there could be fog at that time of the year. I ignored it, not recognizing the significance of the remark, and I forged ahead with the planning. When the thick fog canceled our flight on Christmas Eve from Delhi to Agra, we ended up making a slow and torturous 12-hour ride through the dark on dirt roads over a remarkably short distance. I recalled the travel agent's comment, and I promised myself through gritted teeth to listen intently whenever anyone in those parts made a comment. The travel agent certainly had warned me, but I hadn't heard it. There are even nonverbal messages communicated by the format you choose for a discussion. This is why face-to-face -face meetings are always so important for big decisions. This is especially true in Asia, but I find it's true everywhere I've ever worked. Today, when the facts of a discussion are so easily communicated by email or by phone, it's extremely tempting to communicate that way. But for important discussions, a face-to-face -face meeting is always better. It demonstrates the importance you attach to the outcome of the meeting. The, it proves your own commitment to the issue at hand. The effort it takes for you to come for a face-to-face -face meeting shows respect and gives face, as they say in Asia, to the person you are meeting. And importantly, I have found that offering this gesture of respect often gets you a long way towards the answer you want. My point here is that accomplishing anything, it's essential to work extremely hard at understanding other cultures, how they communicate, both verbally and non-verbally. It's also essential to understand that your own way of communicating may need modification to be comprehensible or effective in other cultures and languages. American norms can be seen by other cultures as overly aggressive, impolite, too personal, too direct, too confrontational. And since it is all about people, you can't overemphasize the importance of finding a way to bridge these differences. Tip number four, when no does not mean no. In the many years I've worked around the globe in different cultures, one big surprise was that almost everywhere, including in the US, no doesn't mean no. It means we need to talk about this. Let me be very quick to say I am just talking about the professional world. In your personal life, no does mean no. But at work, when someone says something is impossible, find out why. Is it unsafe or illegal? Or is it just expensive or inconvenient or embarrassing in some way to the person you're asking? Does it just require someone to understand better or to be persuaded? Is it just unpopular? Is there a historical or cultural constraint that makes someone think it won't work? Or maybe it's just unorthodox or unusual. Once you know what no means in a particular case, you can think, think through how to solve it to make it work. I recall on a first 70-story building in Frankfurt, we were denied a building permit. We were told that for fire safety reasons, we were required to have a 70-story exterior fire stair, which struck us as a bad design idea and a terrifying prospect. We explored the questions, and we learned that the fire regulations had been written for low-rise buildings, because there were so few high-rise buildings in those days, and they'd never updated the code. We worked with the fire department, and we toured in other cities, touring high-rise buildings, showing them pressurized interior fire stairs, computerized class E systems, and so forth. And we persuaded them to update the code and to approve our project. So take the time to understand what no really means when you hear it in any professional context. It will make all the difference. 
Tip number five, probably the most important skill of all is learning to build a cons consensus, starting with determining who needs to agree for something to move forward. Understand your counterparty and what he or she is looking for in the discussion. Cultivate your EQ. Learn to read the room so you understand the nonverbal communication that is happening around you. Is someone opposing you because they are posturing for someone else? Are they disagreeing because going along with you would embarrass them in some way? Is there a history that's affecting the discussion? Does your counterparty have a different agenda? Is there something you can give them without impeding your agenda that would help them with their agenda? Find common ground with the others whose support you need. And before any large meeting be where you want to reach consensus, talk one-on-one -on -one with each key player. Have coffee, have lunch, chat informally, so you understand their perspective and what might prevent them from agreeing. This way, you can diffuse any objections and can forge agreement privately, so no one has to lose face by backing down in the public meeting. Build allies ahead of time, outside the room. And importantly, count your votes before the meeting, so you never put the question till you know you're going to win. Tip number six, do whatever it takes to get it done. I have found that on most initiatives, there are unexpected obstacles that require you to do things you never anticipated. Always be decision-oriented and not process-oriented. Be the person who's willing to do whatever it takes to accomplish your objective. Now, when I say do whatever it takes, I have to immediately clarify that you should never, ever, under any circumstances, no matter how high the stakes, ever cross an ethical or a legal boundary, never. But with that exception, I do mean that you should be willing to do what it takes. During the time that I ran Turner's, that I ran Tishman Spire's Indian operation, there was a moment when our local country head resigned. And we were worried that the rest of the team might become demotivated and resign too. This was a classic example where only a face-to-face -face meeting would do. I needed to drop everything and fly to India for one day to meet with the team to explain how important our Indian operation was to the company and to me, and, and to reinforce to people individually the bright future they would have if they stayed with the company, and if they followed my leadership forward as we built the business. I jumped on a plane ready for my long flight in my jeans and t-shirt and my ancient moccasins ready to make my pitch to my colleagues. They lost my luggage, and I arrived at 2 AM with no fresh clothes of any kind before my 8 AM meeting with our lawyers to prepare for my 9 AM meeting with the team. I thought I improvised pretty well when I persuaded the hotel staff to lend me a white crisp shirt with a collar, and I was hoping no one would notice the Taj Hotel emblem on it. But when I met with our lawyer, she immediately told me this would not do. My spirits fell, and, but then she offered to buy me something. She said we didn't have time to buy Western clothes, and she then terrified me by saying she would not recommend a sari because if you're not used to wearing a sari, it can, be, it can come unwound. And this proved to me again that just when you think things can't get worse, they do. So as she left me in the car to go purchase something for me, I desperately called out the open window, please, something dark, conservative, plain, simple. She returned with a great smile of satisfaction, sure she'd found the perfect thing. We stopped at a local cafe for me to change into it, and she handed me the bag. It was something called a shalwar kameez. For those of you not familiar with this, it's a classic Indian one-size-fits-all loose tunic over loose-fitting pants, and it looks elegant and beautiful on Indian women. She had chosen a banana yellow, gold lame, and crimson striped tunic with sequins over matching banana yellow pants, which had a drawstring top that would fit an elephant, matching crimson cuffs that snapped tightly at the ankles, and then my moccasins. 
I was already nervous about my mission and my likelihood of success. I knew I had to convince people that I was a serious person working for a major multinational company and ask them to bet their professional careers on following me. In Western terms, I was not dressed for success. I've never felt so totally outside my comfort zone. But at 10 minutes to 9, I entered the office, and with butterflies in my stomach, I made my pitch. To my huge surprise, the team was delighted. Even though they may have thought I looked not the way I usually looked, they felt I'd gone the extra mile to reach out to their culture, to respect our Indian business and our Indian staff, and to show my commitment to the Indian business we were building, which is still robust today. In the end, not one person left us. There are clearly many takeaways from this stressful moment, including always travel with a backup outfit. But you cannot possibly overestimate the importance of showing people your willingness to reach across a cultural divide, to go the extra mile, and to demonstrate your personal commitment to the success of a joint cause. Nor can you ever fully anticipate the crazy things you will have to do to accomplish your objectives. My final piece of advice comes back to you, and I hope it will give you some comfort. You are all excellent students with high SAT and GMAT scores, stellar GPAs, and you're accustomed to being close to perfect at everything you do. That is admirable and impressive. And in today's competitive world, it may even be a necessary prerequisite for some of the things you want to do. But I honestly think an expectation of uniformly perfect performance does not prepare you for a high-impact career or a happy life. As you move beyond the student experience, as your focus expands to include partners, children, philanthropic projects, aging parents, and as you face increasingly complex responsibilities with higher stakes and more people affected, the standard of perfection is simply not achievable, not at everything, not every day. So don't try to give yourself a perfect A in every task ahead of you. You'll go crazy, and it can't be done. But be intentional about it. Decide which areas of your life you're willing to get a C and maybe an F. But don't get a C or an F by default. Give yourself permission to have a dirty house or messy closets. Decide not to work out sometimes. Let your car registration lapse. Or skip the meeting in the office when your child is in a school play. But be intentional about what matters most to you at each juncture. Your priorities will change over time, and even every day. They should. In the continuing debate about whether any of us can have it all, I vote yes. But I don't think you can have all of it simultaneously every day in every area of your life. The good news is that you can have most of it most of the time in most areas of your life. So pick the ones that matter. Enjoy your successes, embrace your failures, and make both deliberate. In conclusion, you are all better prepared than any other group of graduates in history. Technology has provided you with better tools to create leverage for your talents than anyone has ever had before. Your GSD education has taught you ways of thinking that will allow you to address issues of great complexity. These are challenging times, times when the centrality of the design and arts has never been more important. The turbulence of these complex times offers you many, many opportunities. So think broadly and creatively about your talents and about your career. Allow yourself to zig and zag and occasionally fail. But make your journey forward towards something that fulfills you. Remember always to think in terms of impact, communicating and collaborating with your peers to leverage your talents and to have the greatest impact on the issues you care about the most. I have confidence that you will achieve great things. I know you will become good stewards of the environment 
great leaders of your communities, and thoughtful citizens of the globe. I'm confident that you will also find great personal rewards and satisfaction along the way. Congratulations, and the very best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Wasn't that wonderful? It's been a wonderful year. It's been a long year. I know that the inspiring words of Catherine were not just for the students. They were equally important for the faculty and for the staff. I know that tonight I'll be thinking about those seven points, and uh, we'll try to remember all of them. Really, thank you so much for, for those words. Now, in the, in, the, in the immortal words of the Singaporean, uh, there may be, I'm hoping, some drinks for you behind this wall. So please join us for a reception. And if you don't mind, we should go around the building this way to the front and then come back again where the reception is held. Thank you. Not through the store.